Hi everyone, this is the video that goes with chapter four, um, the uh, chapter on infant physical development. Um, and just in terms of where we're going uh, in the next few chapters, um, we're gonna talk about physical development in infancy. And then in the next, the next time that we get to um, you know, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, uh, we're gonna spend very little time on physical development. So hang in there for this one if physical development isn't your thing. Um, there's a lot of change in the first couple of years, um, and less so um, when we get to some of the later chapters. Um, before I talk about chapter, okay, um, physical development in infancy, um, there are a couple of uh, terms that come up in this chapter, um, cephalocaudal and proximodistal. Um, cephalocaudal um, development is, uh, refers to development that happens from the top down. Um, and you see that prenatally when you see the embryo start to develop um, from the beginning um, of the neural tube and then develop all the way down. And so you, that is cephalocaudal development. Um, you see that postnatally when um, the infant is born, they can move their head before they can uh, sit up, they can sit up before they can walk. Um, things progress in a top-down fashion. Um, there's all kinds of um, uh, neural maturation that's going on um, that's allowing them to do those kinds of things. There's myelination of uh, neurons that's allowing them to get coordinated movements, and that happens in a top-down fashion. Proximodistal means from the inside, proximal, out to the distal. Um, and inside-out development, you'll see that prenatally when you see the embryo start to form arms before hands, hands before fingers, and those kinds of things. So development gets more, um, uh, more uh, intricate in an inside-out fashion. Um, so uh, you also see that postnatally, um, they can they get um, gross motor skills before they get fine motor skills, um, and so you see um, development pro progressing in that um, in that way. Um, the other two terms um, that come up that aren't super obvious are experience expectant and experience dependent. Um, and typically, when I ask students um, what which what they think those things mean, um, it's often flip flopped, and so. Um, and so um, if that's the case for you, um, I would encourage you to reread that um, a little bit more closely. Experience expectant refers to aspects of development um, that are uh, related to experiences that almost everybody has. And so you don't necessarily need to teach a child to walk, you know, given uh, a, what we would consider a typical or a non-deprived uh, environment all children are going to learn to walk. And so that is experience expectant. Um, it is expected that um, they will have the opportunities to do those kinds of things and have those experiences. Experience dependent, on the other hand, is you will only develop that skill if you have that experience um, and not everybody will have it. And so language might be experience expectant, but a particular language would be experience dependent. Um, you're not going to speak Spanish unless you were exposed to the Spanish language um, in a way that allowed you to learn that. Um, but if you were spoken to at all, you were gonna develop any kind of a language. Um, so those kinds of things. So experience dependent, um, you know, playing the piano requires you to have a particular environment. Experience expectant is the things that, that, that is uh, more universal, that are more universal. Um, when you get into the section on um, motor milestones, gross motor skills and fine motor skills, pay attention in particular to the chapter, uh, to the chart, excuse me, um, that um, shows you um, motor milestones from say birth to I think 16 months. Um, you know, knowing those kinds of things allows you to look at a child that you see in your environment, that you may see in your work, that you know, if you're um, stopped on the side of the road and you found a baby, uh, hopefully you didn't find a baby on the side of the road, but if you did and you called 911 and they said, how old do you think this child is? People who have not been around babies might not have any idea how to guess. Um, but if you have just a little bit of information about what is typical in terms of gross motor skills, um, can the child sit up? If they can sit up but they can't yet walk, well then they're probably six months old but not yet 12 months old. If they can walk but they seem like they're a new walker and they sort of, you know, they're lurching around, um, then maybe they're right around a year old. Um, can they talk? And, and we'll get to that um, in subsequent chapters, how you can use language um, to, uh, to uh, try to at least narrow down how old a child is. Now there's some aspects of physical development where there's not very much variability, and there are other aspects where there's a lot of variability. So when you think about sitting up, um, most children can do that, or most infants can do that between six and seven months. Um, some a little bit earlier, some a little bit later, but it's a pretty narrow range. Um, if a child isn't sitting up at 12 months, 
that's pretty dramatic. That would get the attention of pediatricians and parents and um, all kinds of, of, of professionals. Um, on the other hand, a six month delay in walking, a child that was um, not walking at 12 months and still might not be walking particularly well at 14 or 15 months, not so much concern. You know, you, you're always watching those kinds of things, but you might say, well, what's the child's environment like? Do they have siblings that are bringing things to them? You know, what, are, what have their opportunities been? What have their affordances been um, to develop more walking skills? And so, you know, some of them are, are a narrower range and some have a much wider range. Um, uh, Esther Thalen's research um, is highlighted in the book, the dynamic systems theory, the idea that um, things don't just unfold. We don't just mature, but it's a combination of physical maturation, um, you know, changes in, uh, in your nervous system, and also the child's motivation to do a particular thing. And if they're motivated to do that thing, all of those systems have to interact in order for them to develop that skill. Um, so that's the idea behind um, dynamic systems theory. Um, and then last in this chapter, um, the last thing I wanted to highlight was reflexes. Um, there are certain reflexes, a lot of the reflexes um, are exactly what they sound like. The, the eye blink reflex, the swallowing reflex, um, everybody knows what those are. The moro reflex um, is the startle re reflex where um, you see a child um, startle and, and then try and grasp something. Um, so that one is named after the person. And also the Babinski reflex, and I'm not sure that that one is to, um, it's talked about in your book. The Babinski reflex, if you have a, take a child's foot, and you um, draw from your finger from the heel up to the toes, the toes will fan out, and if you draw it the other way, they will curl back. Um, that's the Babin Babinski research, uh, reflex. Um, so um, some reflexes go away. Um, they're present at birth, and then they go away. Um, they may have had some sort of an evolutionary adaptational quality, um, and then you know, later on, so the stepping reflex may go away, and then later on the child learns to walk. Um, you know, one thing that um, I think students don't realize, though, is that reflexes aren't just those kinds of things, but the eye blink reflex, um, it, you know, is sustained throughout life. The uh, swallowing reflex, the gag reflex, those kinds of things. So all of those reflexes um, are um, interesting um, to study in terms of uh, physical development. Um, so that's it for Chapter 4. Um, have a good week, and um, next week we'll be talking about uh, Chapter 5, but also your papers. Um, and the options that you have for that. So um, have a good week and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, bye.